What's up, fellow nerds, and welcome to Not Your Status Quo's Doom Patrol Season 2 Breakdown and Review. And be warned, there will be spoilers. And remember, if you like what we do here, hit that like button and make Hammerhead the primary to blast the subscribe button. And share this video with all your friends and stretch your arm out like Elastigirl to ring that bell and be notified of future videos. A little background on the story. The uh, Doom Patrol was originally written in 1963. And since 1968, when Arnold Drake, one of the original writers, killed the team off in Doom Patrol 121, there have been six Doom Patrol comic series, with Robot Man being the only constant member in all of them. And as far as the show, um, the opening theme and credits, end credits run a lot like the Marvel TV shows from Netflix that I've seen. And the story for season two. I mean, I think overall this season was all about family. We had Niall's relationship with his daughter, Dorothy, really taking center stage. But we also had Larry and his son and family. We had Robot Man and his daughter. And spoiler alert, grandson. Uh, Jane and the Underground with a lot of background on Kay. And then we had some story with Rita and her mother. And then Cyborg also had a relationship that kind of included Niles and his own father's tech that was implanted into her. Yeah, I really liked uh, the overall themes in this uh, season. Uh, mostly that idea of each character kind of shedding their outside family and accepting their sort of fellow Doom Patrol members as their new family. And each actor is amazing in their role. I mean. Brendan Fraser kind of disappeared off the scene for a long time as Robot Man, you know, Cliff Steele. Uh, he has an amazing uh, repertoire of swear words that come out of his mouth. On this show, it's definitely not for kids. Um, Diane Guerrero uh, plays Crazy Jane, or um, her original character's persona is um, uh, Kay Chalice, little girl. And uh, April Bowlby, she used to be on um, Two and a Half Men. And she was she plays the last girl, Arita Farr. Her real name is Gertrude Crump, and she's also appeared on Titans. I guess with the rest of the crew also has too. Matt Bomer uh, is negative man. Larry Trainer does a great job. Timothy Dalton, you know James Bond for crying out loud, plays the chief. Niles Calder, and um, I, I hopefully I'm not butch butchering his name, but Joyvin Wade um, plays Cyborg. And a shout out, um, we got Phil Morris on this show who played um, Silas Stone. And on Smallville, he played the Martian Manhunter. And he was one of my favorite characters on that, on that show. But each, each character, each actor dives into their character and they just, you can feel how each of them um, really feels about the show. They, both, they all have their own demons that they're fighting. I think the best performance to me, is Diane Guerrero uh, corralling all 64, uh, although they don't show 64, but she has multiple personalities on the show that she just does wonderfully. Um, so the show, the plot lines are very comic book, and they're not ashamed to be so. Um, we'll get to that in a second, some of the crazy stuff. Um, and there's less action in this, in this season, uh, more plot development, which I like. I like to see uh, depth in the plot and depth from characters so that they can, um, you can understand what's really going on in their head, what's really supposed to happen on the show. And this season really addresses the human condition. We see each color, each uh, character develop and struggle with their own identity. They're not always heroes, um, but they're, you know, they're losers, you know? Going, uh, you know, kind of continuing off of what uh, Dave was saying with all of the, uh, the different characters and all of these actors, you know, they really were amazing, like what he said. Uh, but I'd say one of... Um, the, uh, the best new uh, characters that we got in this season was the character of Dorothy. Now, um, she's always been a part of the Doom Patrol, but uh, she was kind of given a slightly different character uh, for, this, uh, for this specific series. Uh, so she was originally foreshadowed um, in the last season. In uh, episode five, about 28 minutes in or so, uh, Robot Man is, uh, you know, he's walking along um, with Hammerhead at the time who uh, was taking over crazy Jane. And uh, he says to her, uh, you know, God, can't we just ride out the apocalypse without all this shit? I thought we were, uh, we had a good thing going, two freaks on a yellow brick road or something like that. Uh, so she is actually portrayed by Abigail Shapiro. And um, she does a great job through this whole series, especially 
uh, her interactions with uh, with uh, Crazy Jane's baby girl character. Um, so she is named after Dorothy Gale from Wizard of Oz, and her last name, Spinner, uh, so this character, her name is Dorothy Spinner, it's a reference to the spinning cyclone in the Wizard of Oz. Uh, she does suffer from a facial deformity, which kind of varies uh, in each uh, version of her in the comic book. Um, in the series, however, uh, this actually just happens to come from the fact that um, her, uh, it comes from her mother. It's more of a genetic thing, more so than like a, a deformity. Um, so she's got, uh, oh, and uh, what I was mentioning, uh, what makes it a little bit different from all of her appearances in the comics is in this series, she's actually the daughter of Chief. Uh, so now again, this uh, departs from all the comics where uh, she was actually, um, you know, she had birth parents and she was uh, adopted. Uh, her powers include psychokinesis, uh, which is kind of like a catch-all term for a lot of different powers that you'll find, uh, you know, from metahumans in the DC universe. But her specifically allows her to bring her imaginary friends to life. And uh, man, we're going to talk about some of them a little bit later on. Um, she also has a bit of immortality, which we also find out uh, Chief has as well. And, um, uh, you know, he ends up having to give that up in the first episode. Um, and we find out in the last episode, well, unfortunately, the last episode of the season due to um, something uh, that uh, happened that we'll mention in a minute, um, she's able to manifest weapons as well, which is uh, really neat. Uh, so also something that, uh, that happens towards uh, the end of this season, uh, a little nod to her uh, namesake, Dorothy visits her mother in a vision, and at one point she's wearing red boots. I think it's kind of cool, um, which is kind of a nod to uh, Dorothy Gale's ruby slippers. And uh, overall, my my kind of thoughts about this character was that uh, it really reminded me of um, another character that I had seen, um, and I have a feeling that maybe uh, maybe this character was uh, uh, created sort of based on Dorothy Spinner. Uh, but there was a character in Justice League Unlimited. I guess she was more of a villain, really. Uh, Ace of Clubs. And uh, she had a very similar power set. She could uh, use psychokinesis to basically manipulate the world around her, up to including in the episode that she was in, in the main episode that uh, she was in, she actually even created her own fantasy world, including a yellow brick road. Um, and she even has an equally tragic ending. Uh, now, um, the season finale that I had mentioned, uh, so it wasn't actually supposed to be the final episode of the season. Uh, unfortunately, there was supposed to be a 10th episode in the season. However, the, um, God, what was it that happened? I want to say it was uh, Nickelback went on tour or something. Uh, but yeah, it basically, it shut down production. And of all the storylines we got this season, I, I think Jane in the Underground was my absolute favorite. You know, a lot of it has to do with Diane Geronimo's performance, which is absolutely spectacular. You know, Dave talked about it earlier. She goes seamless from you know character to character i thought it was amazing but getting into the history of Kay growing up and the surprise when jane found miranda's body in that well in the final episode you know and the fact that part of what was going on with her also intersected with dorothy when she was playing you know doug mentioned how the baby jane and dorothy getting along was going really well well things got kind of bad and dorothy unleashed candle maker who killed you know baby jane and uh, one of the other personas, which I thought was really well done. It really was uh, good to see this interaction and all the storylines, you know, melded very well together. But I am looking forward to this continuing next season because like Doug said, it was cut short. I don't think they'd be able to finish all that we needed to see in one more episode. So I do think it was something they were probably planning on continuing into season three, which I hope we get the green light for, or the news of it, the green light soon. And in another episode, we get to meet the Sex Men. Uh, in an in a absolutely tremendous episode, Sex Patrol, because, you know, all the episodes are something patrol. And it basically has Doom Patrol having a party to bring Danny Street back, who you remember from season one, who was turned into a brick, to bring him back to his former glory. And, you know, it's, since we continue to see those sex ghosts around the mansion, I think in future episodes, there's a really good chance where they're going to come back in season three or season four, and it'll definitely be nice to see them come back. And that Sex Man episode was insane. It's definitely not for kids. 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's that is an understatement, Dave. Man, they that was nuts. And uh, so the the Sex Men they came from from the comics. They're uh, they're a little bit different in the show. Um, I would say they're almost they they seem to me very Ghostbuster like. Uh, they came in with their you know like um their meters and their their reading for you know um paranormal sexual activity. But yeah, basically they've got these packs on their back and they've got these guns and and they're uh, they're paranormal investigators and sex demon hunters. And uh, the characters include uh, the perfectly named Captain Kiss, Lieutenant Cuddle, and Lieutenant Torture. In another episode, we meet Niall's old research team, a group of ageless astronauts called the Pioneers of the Uncharted. And the Russian woman has a negative spirit, a lot like Larry. And she has actually learned to get it under control and even though we don't see it play out in this season, I do think it is setting the groundwork for Larry getting his negative spirit a little bit more under control in you know, future seasons, because it pretty much does what it wants at this point. And I think we're going to see him get it a little under control, you know, see that build up over multiple seasons. I also thought that her puppeteering of her fellow astronauts was a tad on the uh, evil side. And I wonder if at some point we're going to see her come back as a possible villain and another season. So in episode five, uh, if you uh, if you were sitting there thinking for a minute, you know what, Doom Patrol, it hasn't quite uh, you know gotten weird enough. Uh, we are treated to just perfection. We're given an episode, or at least like a, an episode opener for Steel and Stone. It just seems kind of pop out of nowhere, like just <laughs> it has nothing to do with what's uh, going on at the moment. But it's this uh, 70s buddy cop show starring our friends Robot Man and Cyborg. And uh, Cyborg, even um, at one point, he yells out uh, his signature catchphrase, or at least his animated version's signature catchphrase, Booyah! at one point, and it was great. It was uh, beautiful. Uh, but the entire production turns out to be um, all in Robot Man's imagination. I really hope that they bring it back or that they reference it or, you know, just, just make it an ongoing series. I would love to see that. And they had a similar um, occurrence, if you will, of another TV show type thing with the beekeeper and cyborg with uh, Rita Farr doing the same thing. I think it was a fifties uh, type of montage as well, just like the steel and stone. Um, but all that being said, cyborg was actually written into this show. He was not part of, of the Doom Patrol in the comics. So um, with DC, you know, liking Cyborg a lot, I, I assume they want to, they stick them into all their productions in it. I don't think it's a bad idea. Yeah, we also have a few other things that need to be sorted out next season or at some point in the future. And one of those is Cyborg going after Ronnie. Since in that final episode, we did see who, one of the, one of my favorite imaginary characters, Dr. Cowboy was telling him, you talk about a perfect kid's imaginary hero. He's a doctor and he's a cowboy. <laughs> you know, he was telling him, well, she murdered people, but you know, I support your decision. That's what I'm here to do. Whatever you did is the right thing. She killed people, but it's okay. And then, you know, we're gonna have the uh, possible continuation of the underground mystery, which with who is posing as Miranda, you know, it, for some reason when it first happened, I was thinking, you know, Kay's old dad somehow was able to infiltrate it. I don't know if that's true, but that was the first thing that popped in my head. We also have Reader, Rita and her mother issues. And will she get rave reviews as the beekeeper? And finally, hopefully Cliff will get to see his grandson being born after he did promise his daughter after missing her wedding that he would be there for that. We also got tons of classic Doom Patrol villains, you know, like Dr. Time, Red Jack, Descanse, and the overall villain, the candle maker, and the way the season ended with him taking a, a ready to fight Dorothy, who, as Doug talked about, created her own weapon to go fight him. You know, they disappeared somewhere. You know, Dorothy's mom was like, she's ready. She needs to do this. Not only makes me want to see season three, but it also makes me wonder, you know, how much was going to be resolved in that 10th episode if we would have got it, if production wouldn't have been halted. And, you know, I'll go back, you know, the Red Jack episode, I just uh, called Pain Patrol, because once again, every episode is something patrol, uh, was one of my favorites of this season. And I really hope that his death was greatly exaggerated so he can return 
uh, to torture the Doom Patrol more. Talking about villains, I uh, I think a couple of my favorite was uh, starting with uh, going back to um, the Sex Patrol episode, uh, Shadowy Mister Evans. Now, first off, that that name by itself is great, and again, this comes uh, straight from the Doom Patrol comics. So you know, uh, it's, look it up. But he is a sex demon who feeds on the sexual energy of uh, usually like a, um, you know, an orgy or something like that. Uh, he is, he was uh, in the series portrayed by Brad Brinkley. Um, this, uh, this sex demon plans on transforming the earth into a hellish landscape of orgies and depravity, a sextinction as, uh, as um, uh, the, uh, the, our, our sex squad happens to, uh, to mention it. And uh, he's going to do this by giving birth to a child who's going to end the world with his first cry. And uh, he has to be stopped by Crazy Jane. Um, or, uh, well, they want Robot Man to do it, but he's too embarrassed. But yeah, he has to be stopped by, uh, by Crazy Jane. And then I think my, f- my favorite villain just for the... I guess the insanity of it all would be Dr. Time, again, straight from the comics. Um, I, I mean, just what what even was this? Uh, he, he is a roller disco fanatic time-traveling villain with like a clock-shaped helmet covering his whole head. And, uh, oh man, he's, uh, he's, he's nuts. I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not even sure what to, what to say about that, but that was uh, quite crazy, um, that, that whole episode. But uh, speaking of the insanity, um, let's talk about a couple of fun facts of, uh, of this series. Um, so, although this is very similar uh, to the X-Men, Doom Patrol surprisingly actually predates the X-Men. Uh, Doom Pro- Patrol premiered in number 80, uh, issue number 80 of My Greatest Adventure, which came out in June of 1963, as uh, Dave uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, the X-Men, they premiered in issue number one of the X-Men in September of 1963. Um, Another little uh, fun fact about this character, um, or about this uh, series, is one of my favorite characters, and that's uh, Willoughby Kipling. Um, So when he uh, was first introduced in season one, my initial thought was, man, this guy seems just like Constantine. And it turns out that's because he is, or at least he was supposed to be. So uh, when the writers, uh, uh, specifically the writer Grant Morrison, uh, when he was um, putting together Doom Patrol number 31, where um, John Constantine was supposed to, uh, you know, join up with uh, the Doom Patrol, um, he was basically told by the editorial team of Hellblazer, which was Constantine's solo series, that they wouldn't allow it. So he basically kept all of the same lines and all the same mannerisms and he just renamed the character to Willoughby Kipling. So he's basically um, kind of a knockoff of John Constantine. The only difference being is at the time, Constantine wasn't really um, a very good magician. Uh, He was more of a con man magician, whereas Willoughby would actually be um, a better magician than uh, Constantine was. Now, obviously the character has changed since then, but uh, yeah, I thought that uh, that was uh, some interesting fun facts. But hey, what do you guys uh, what do you guys think of this uh, season overall? Well, I didn't watch it like uh, most people did. I know this one came out uh, on a weekly basis. I I got lucky enough to watch them all at once. I watched this whole season within the last two days, and overall, um, you know, it does a lot of jumping around. Like it, when you get into each show, you know, it'll flash back to another year to explain a different part about a different character, which, you know, if you're not following along, if you're casually watching it, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. So you need to watch, you need to pay attention. But I love the depth of the, that, that gives us so much depth in the plot and the characters, you know, why they're doing what they're doing, they, you know, their motivations. So I loved it. Um, I give it a review of nine out of 10. You yeah, think? you know, I uh, I totally have to agree with you, Dave. Um, I loved it. It hit the ground running. Um, I actually think I liked this season better than season one. And um, 
Uh, so at first, when I was uh, when I was initially thinking of how I wanted to review this, I was thinking, you know what, I'll probably end up like giving it a bit of a handicap because it was uh, an episode was cut from it uh, because of uh, you know the uh, aforementioned Nickelback tour. Um, so uh, you know, I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to have to give it a little bit of a little slide, but I, I don't even have to. I mean, I can easily rate this a nine out of ten. Uh, it was just so wacky, so crazy, so out there. The villains that uh, that Keith and I mentioned were just, I mean, yeah, they come from the uh, the Doom Patrol comics, but they were put onto the big screen. Well, I guess uh, the little screen, depending on how big your TV is. Uh, but uh, they were displayed perfectly, in my opinion. And I loved the continuation of the story. And I thought some of the... Uh, there, there weren't too many, but the couple of little changes that they made from the comics to uh, this series, I think they worked. I think it worked out really well. And while I loved almost every episode, some a little more than others, but I think with Pain Patrol and Sex Patrol being my two favorites, I do feel a little cheated that we didn't get to see that main story get resolved and see the final battle between Dorothy and the Candlemaker. Just felt a little like the season was incomplete to me. And don't get me wrong, I love cliffhangers since it gives us something to think and wonder about, you know, before the next season comes out, usually isn't part of the main storyline. But, I mean, this season we got tons of great performances. That always helps. The music and score was spot on. And the writing was great. I mean, they interweaved all of these different plot lines together seamlessly. And I thought they did a wonderful job with that. But I still think I like season one a little bit better than season two. So I'm going to give this a 9.2 out of 10. And if you haven't checked it out, you definitely need to either get HBO Max or DC Universe and check out Doom Patrol because it'll be worth the time to watch all these episodes. But for those of you who did watch it, what did you all think? 